Um, uh, as much as I, I, was, as I was thinking about today, as I was prepping for today, I kind of pictured this moment in the room with all of you, and in my mind, I couldn't imagine, I couldn't picture whether this weekend would get like the most engagement during the teaching, like the most amens and applause at the end, or the absolute least, and then I remembered that I live in Wisconsin, and I was like, it's going to be dead silent in that room, so uh, I understand, um, but as we get started today, I want to do a little exercise just to get us all on the same page, a short of hands, if you come to Heartland, you know I love doing this uh, at the beginning of teachings, just to kind of kind of get us all in it together, just to show our cards where we're coming from. But don't worry, I'm not going to ask you to get too personal. But I do want to do a quick show of hands. And my question would be, how many of you are like me? I would put myself in this category. And you kind of love a presidential election. Like you will on November 5th, you will stay up later at night than you normally do so that you can watch the results come in and like which way are the swing states going. How many of you are like, you kind of love election night, yeah? Okay, so less of you. Okay, how many of you are the opposite, and you, if you could just like hit a button and skip to Thanksgiving, and like it was all behind you, how many of you? Okay, that's a lot more of you, yeah, that's uh, definitely where the crowd is uh, at, at uh, 9 o'clock, 9.30 today. Um, so I'll tell you, as we get going, I'll tell you where I'm coming from. Uh, I do kind of love love this stuff. Like I, I, I mean, I don't love everything that goes along with the presidential election. Some of the stuff that gets said, whatever. But but I do enjoy these uh, elections, and I do love our system of government. Like when I was in high school, government class was my favorite class. Uh, when I went to college, I did a minor in political science. I thought a lot about going to law school, but I got married young, and I needed a job. Apparently, she wanted to eat, so I was like, okay, so I got a job. And uh, didn't go down that path, but I just, I, I do love our system of government, actually. I love the three branches. I love that the founding fathers, like, had the foresight to put in a system of checks and balances where one branch of the government couldn't do it all on the, their own, where they need the other branches to, like, provide some checks and balances. I think it's brilliant. And, uh, and so I kind, of, I kind of enjoy this. On one hand, I love the po political, like, arena. I do. I enjoy the political arena on one hand. On the other hand, I have clearly built my life around my faith in Jesus. My faith is is, is so, so important to me. It's the founding, you know, building blocks of my life. And so I'm personally excited over the course of the next two weeks to simply talk together and to think together with so many of you about the, the relationship between our faith and our politics. And as we get started today, as we get the series going today, I'll tell you what I think is the really at the core of all of that overlapping and relationship. I'll tell you, I think there is a question that every follower of Jesus has to wrestle down in their own mind as we think about the relationship between faith and politics. Now, if you're new to church, if you're new to Heartland, maybe you're just exploring what it looks like to be a follower of Jesus, you get a pass on this. Like, you have the luxury over the next two weeks of sitting here and just learning and just observing and just hearing, like, what does... What does scripture teach us? What does Jesus have to say about the relationship between faith and politics? And if you don't like it, you don't have to do it. You have the luxury of going, these Christians are suckers, <laughs> you know? So you get to just explore. But if you're a follower of Jesus, this is the question we have to wrestle down. And the question is, are you willing to put your allegiance to Jesus first and your allegiance to your political party second? Are you willing to put Jesus first and your political party second. Another way to ask this question is simply by saying, are you willing to look at politics through the lens of your faith, or will you create a version of your faith that conforms to your political views? Right? We all look at the world through a, a lens, through some filter. And as you look at the world, will you look at, your, at the political world and the political conversation through the lens of your faith, or will you create a version of faith that supports what you think politically? Now, what's interesting about this question is that Christians on both sides of the aisle would say, I'm already doing that. Right? Christians on both sides of the aisle would say, John, the reason that I am a part of the political party I'm a part of is because of my faith in Jesus. People on both sides of the aisle, Christians on both sides of the political aisle, Christian Republicans and Christian Democrats, will both make the argument, John, if Jesus was an American today, 
He would vote like me. It's because of Jesus that I vote the way that I want to. And both cases, and both sides can make cases for the argument. Both cases have reasons why. Both cases would point to things they read in the Bible and be like, clearly Jesus was a, was a you know, the Christian who are Republicans will say, you know, something like, you know, um, you know John, Jesus Jesus called Matthew to be one of his inner circle disciples, and uh, we know that Matthew was a tax collector, but if you grew up with like a King James version of the Bible, right, tax collectors were called publicans, and so it's kind of like in the name that, that, that you know, we, we read verses like Matthew 9, 9, which says, and it came to pass as Jesus sat at meat in the house, behold, many, here it is, many publicans came and sat down with him and his disciples. So Jesus welcomed the publicans. Jesus would welcome the Republicans today, right? That's what we would say. But if you're a Democrat, you look at that verse and you go, wait, 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 there was more to that verse. What did you cut something out? And they're they're right. It says, and it came to pass as Jesus sat at meat in the house, behold, many publicans and sinners came and sat down. So the Democrats who are Christians would say, John, look, he wasn't endorsing the publicans. He thought they were sinners. He, he thought the publicans needed saving. Jesus would be a Democrat today. And, and, and then you'd say, well, maybe Jesus, you know, clearly Jesus would vote for Democrats because Jesus was a health care dispensing machine, right? Everywhere he went, he gave free health care. He healed everybody. He never asked for payment. So he was like, free health care for everybody, right? It's like Oprah, you know. Uh, this is Jesus. So of course, I'm, I'm kidding here. But the point is that, re- that both Christians who vote Republican and Christians who vote Democratic will both point to Jesus and say, I can make a case for my political views because of my faith in Jesus. And so the question remains, what does it look like to put Jesus first and our political opinions second? What does it look like to view our political opinions through the lens of Jesus. That's where I want us to start today. And I'll tell you, I think what it means, or what that looks like, is it means that we filter everything that we say and do through the lens of Jesus' most most central teaching, right? Through the thing that Jesus said was the absolute most important to get right. Right? We have to keep that calling by Jesus on the lives of his followers front and center as we engage with our political conversations. If we can do that, the overlap with our faith in politics will be okay. So that's where I want to go this morning. Um, You are probably familiar with this passage. In fact, uh, three of the four gospel writers record a conversation around Jesus's teaching where he said, this is the most important thing for my followers to get right. Uh, The fourth gospel, John, doesn't record a literal conversation that Jesus had around this, but basically the entire gospel of John is built around this. And so it's really there in all four of the accounts we have of Jesus. Um, You might remember in Matthew's gospel. In Matthew's gospel, somebody, a teacher in religious law comes to Jesus and he says, Jesus, what is the single most important thing for, for us to get right? Of all of our commands, of all the 600 plus commands that God has given to us, what is the single most important one? And you might know, Jesus shocked the crowd with his answer. Well, in Luke's gospel, where we're going to look at it today, it seems like the person who comes to ask Jesus this question has has maybe, maybe he was there when Jesus said this the first time. Maybe he was in the crowd when he heard Jesus give that answer. So now he's had some time to think about it, but he comes back and he says, Hey, I want to follow up on that, Jesus. Let's go, back. Let's go back to that conversation. And so this is where we pick up the story in Luke. We read in Luke um, chapter 10, on one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus, wanted to test him. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Well, Jesus kind of turns the table on him. Jesus says, what is written in the law? How do you read it? He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. Now, this is good, okay? Jesus must have been impressed because this was a radical answer. For so long, the Jews understood that loving God was the the primary calling on their life. That was the thing that was most important to do, but if you think about it, that's, that's internal, Right? Loving God with all of your heart and with all of your mind and with all of your soul and with all of your strength, that's internal. 
And so for, for generations, the Israelites, the Jews, were, were, under, were under, understanding that the, the primary call was to love God. But Jesus, in that conversation in Matthew's gospel, had, had, had included loving other people along with that. Jesus' point was that you might love God internally, but the way that you love other people externally is how it gets demonstrated. That's how your love for God gets lived out. Loving people and loving God are two sides of the same coin. So this guy understood that. He understood at least that that was the answer Jesus was looking for. And so he said, what's the most important command, Jesus? Jesus turns it back on me and says, love God, love people. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you will live. Way to go. You were listening. But, Jesus had to be like, man, there is always a but with these guys. But he wanted to justify himself, so he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Jesus, who is the neighbor that I have to love as myself? This guy was looking for for the boundaries of that requirement to love other people. He wanted to know how far that goes, who gets included. He wanted, maybe he was looking for a loophole, right? Maybe this guy would have been a great politician. Um, He's good at looking for loopholes, right? He wants to know, who are my neighbors? It's a good question. It's a fair question, right? Are my neighbors that I'm supposed to love my literal neighbors? Like when Jesus said that, was he only talking about the people who live next door to us? Like maybe you've got somebody across the street, you've got somebody to the left and right. You love those three homes, those three people, you're good. Is that our neighbor? Was he talking about the whole subdivision? Was he talking about our whole community, the whole town that you live in? Who did Jesus mean when he said neighbor? So Jesus thinks about it for a second. He goes, how am I going to illustrate this for this guy, for this crowd, for future generations? And he tells a story. He tells a parable to illustrate the answer. In reply, Jesus said, a man was going down from Jerusalem, because Jerusalem was elevation, was very high. He was going down from Jerusalem to the town of Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes. They beat him and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So to a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him pass by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day, he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. And Jesus replied, go and do likewise. Now, This parable would have been so much harder for Jesus' listeners to have heard that day than it is for us today. I'm telling you, the tension in that moment when Jesus' crowd listened to this, this story, I bet you could have cut it with a knife. I bet it killed this Jewish religious leader to have to hold up a Samaritan of all people as the hero of the story, as the one that Jesus said, that's who you have to be like. And the reason for that dramatic moment in this story is because of the relationship between the Jews and the Samaritans. And to understand the relationship between the Jews and the Samaritans, you have to go back roughly 700 years. You go back 700 or so years, and the the nation of Israel is a united kingdom. It's like their, their glory days as a country. But after Solomon, King Solomon's death, the the nation gets split into two. There's a civil war, and the the nation gets divided into the northern kingdom. Uh, And and the northern kingdom is is headquartered in the city of Samaria. And then you have the southern kingdom, which is headquartered around the city of Jerusalem. 
Well, the Assyrian Empire in 722 conquers the northern kingdom, and they ship off, they exile so many of the Jews who are living there, and then they forcibly relocate other people into the region. Over the course of several generations, those people intermarry with the Jews who are left, and by the time we get to Jesus' day, they believe that they were the true descendants of Israel, that they were God's chosen people. That's what they believe. Of course. The Jews who had lived in the southern kingdom and their descendants vehemently disagreed. And by the time we get to Jesus in the first century, these two groups wanted absolutely nothing to do with each other to the point where they wouldn't even walk through each other's region, which was kind of crazy because of the way the map laid it out. In fact, here's a map to show you the area. You can see Judea in the south and Galilee in the north. Those were both kind of the Jewish territories, and then you've got Samaria smack dab in the middle. And so these people would literally go around Samaria to get up to Galilee or down into Judea. And so one more example of of how dramatic the, the, the relationship was between these two people groups. One time Jesus and his followers were traveling and um, they had to pass through Samaria. And so Jesus says, we're going to pass through Samaria. We're not going to go around it. So they pass through Samaria and it gets to the evening and they need a place to stay. They want to they want to go to bed. And so they they ask an innkeeper if there's if there's a place where they can, you know, crash for the night. And they the Samaritans discover that these are Jews and they reject them. They say, "No, you're not welcome here." And so in response, two of Jesus' disciples literally say to Jesus, Jesus, do you want us to call down fire from heaven and just wipe these people out finally? Is God ready to just be done with them? And so Jesus, you can imagine Jesus in this moment, he looks at him and he's like, what? Are you kidding me? No, I don't want you to call down fire from heaven. Come on, guys, get back in the minivan. Like, what has gotten into you? Of course I don't want you to mass kill them all, right? But that was the relationship between the Jews and the Samaritans. And and so in Jesus' parable, we're told that the man was traveling from Jerusalem to Jericho. Both of those are in the southern region of Judea. You see Jerusalem and just above it, Jericho. Now, who would be traveling from Jerusalem to Jericho, a Jew or a Samaritan? A Jew, yeah. In 99% of scenarios, that would only be a Jewish person. A Samaritan would not have been in Jerusalem and wanting to go to Jericho. And so it's understood that Jesus' listeners would have assumed that this man was a Jew. And Jesus tells the story along the way he gets attacked, he gets beaten to the point of like he is literally like, like his, his half dead, he gets robbed, and he's left there. Well, you might imagine, luckily for him, along comes a Jewish priest. But instead of helping this man, what does he do? Jesus said he crossed over to the other side in order to get around him. And you have to understand the reason he would have done that was because touching somebody who was covered in blood and potentially even a dead body would have made this priest ceremonially unclean. It would have made him ritually unclean, and he didn't want to risk that because he believed God would not want me to do that. Then a Levite comes along. And a Levite was supposed, to be, was supposed to be from the group that was like the most holy of the Jews. They were supposed to maintain the holiness of the Jews. And so this Levite sees the man on the ground as well. And what does he do? He does the exact same thing. He crosses over to the other side because, of course, this is what God would want me to do. God would want me to maintain my holiness by not helping. I got to love God above all else, of course. But then a Samaritan comes along and he cares for the man. He bandages his wounds. He cleans him up. He lifts him up and places him on his own donkey and he takes him to an inn where he pays for his medical attention. In short, this man loved his neighbor and Jesus said, if you want to follow me, Go and be like the Samaritan. Do in concrete ways the things he did. So 
When it comes to our understanding of the interaction between our faith and our politics, what did the Samaritan man do that, that, that was so good that we should emulate today? I'll give you three, okay? I'll give you three. The first thing that the Samaritan did was the Samaritan cared more about the person's needs than about what the person believed. You see that in the story? The Samaritan cared more about the person's needs than about what the person believed. At the center of the divide between the Jews and the Samaritans was their conflicting beliefs, a conflicting way to view the world. They disagreed, first of all, about where they were supposed to worship. Jews believed that the only place to worship in the presence of God was at their temple in the city of Jerusalem. Samaritans did not agree with that. They believed that the right place to worship was at their temple on Mount Gerizim in Samaria. Not only did they disagree about, about where they were supposed to worship, they disagreed about what constituted authoritative scriptures. So the Samaritans, on one hand, believed that only the first five books of our Old Testament, the text that we call the Torah, they believed only the Torah was authoritative for their lives. Jews had added to that the writings of the Psalms and the prophets, and so they disagreed with each other. They believed differently when it came to that. They had set up entirely different religious systems, sacrificial systems, separate priesthoods, you name it. They did not agree with each other. Their beliefs created this massive divide between them that I think in many ways you could compare to the divide between Republicans and Democrats today. The divide down the aisle was massive, and yet, the Samaritan in the story cared more about the person's needs than about what the person believed. When it comes to our culture today, it is so easy to, to, to take the people who we disagree with politically and to just, just choose to like avoid them at all costs. It is so easy to take the people that we disagree with politically and to see their needs and to go out of our way to get to the other side. But why would we do that? Especially when you consider the fact that we don't believe that people go to Washington, D.C. when they die, right? We don't think anybody goes to D.C. when they die. Nobody wants to spend eternity in D.C., <laughs> You know, and, and in all the opportunities, on all the occasions that I've sat with somebody in their final days before they pass away and enter into the other side of eternity, of all the times that I've had the opportunity to do that, no one has ever said to me, John, would you just read to me a couple passages from the Constitution? <laughs> right? No, they want to hear the words of Jesus. So if at the end of our life, if it's, if it's easy at that point to place our, our politics below our faith and to elevate our faith to its rightful place, if that's where we're all going to get on our deathbed, why wouldn't we choose to get there sooner? And to live in a way where we see other people through the lens of seeing their needs and not just what they believe. That's what the Samaritan did. The second thing that the Samaritan did was he loved without getting anything in return. He loved even when it cost him something. The Jewish man who is laying on the ground, as far as we can tell, and the Samaritan who's passing by at no point negotiated with each other. He, he wasn't like, hey, 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 buddy. Hey, are you? Hey, buddy, are, you know, if you'll pay me back double, I'll take care of you. Right? The Jewish man on the ground wasn't like, yeah, you know, okay, 50-50, okay. No, he's like, I'll give you double or not. <laughs> what? So no, but he loved him without getting anything in return. The Samaritan would not have ever gotten anything back. He wouldn't get his time back. He wouldn't get his money back. He wouldn't get, in some cases, his reputation back for crossing that divide. But he loved without getting anything in return. As followers of Jesus, we are called to do the same. When it comes to politics, there's this phrase, and, and you might hear it in conversations around political like pieces of legislation where we hear people say, I'll scratch your back if you scratch my back. 
right? I'll, I'll support your cause if you support my cause. I'll vote for your piece of legislation if you vote for my piece of legislation. And sometimes when it comes to, to the legislative branch of the government, that's important because that's what consensus building looks like sometimes. But as followers of Jesus, that is not how we are called to love. We do not love, we do not scratch their back if they'll scratch our back. We love even when we get nothing in return because that is how we have been loved by God. Think about this. Just because somebody sees you as their enemy, you do not have to return the favor, right? Just because somebody sees you as their enemy, you do not have to return the, the favor, In fact, at one point in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus specifically says this. He says, listen, you know how the vast majority of your culture lives. They only love those who love them. But he says, not so with you. And he says in the Sermon on the Mount, he said, but I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. And that way you will be sons and daughters of your father in heaven. One of the things that... We see so often in our, in our culture today is that people increasingly are cutting people who disagree with them out of their life. We, we, we see them as our enemy, and so what do you do with an enemy? You gotta remove an enemy. You gotta, you gotta destroy the enemy. You gotta put up boundaries and say, I'm not gonna give you a place in my life. But when we do that, what we do is we basically just eliminate everybody whose beliefs are different than our own, and we create an echo chamber. And by, by just living in an echo chamber where we only hear the things that we agree with and we support, it just reinforces it and it, it digs the divide deeper and deeper and deeper. It does nothing to build a loving relationship with people who we understand and we learn from and we engage with and we care about and we love. Where the culture does not want to does not want to listen to the other side, we as followers of Jesus should look to listen where so many people in culture do not care about what the other side thinks, we are called to care about what they think about. We are called to listen. We are called to love even when they will not. We are called to love even when we get nothing in return. And the third thing that the Samaritan did that emulate, that we should emulate, is that the Samaritan stood out by being different. The priest and the Levite were just like each other. They were just like every other person who went down the road that day. They were just like every Jewish person that, or, or Samaritan person that, that you would have expected to go down that road. Do you ever feel like when it comes to our, our politics and the political arena that everybody's the same? Right? It feels sometimes like it doesn't really matter like which candidate is on the ballot. All I really care about is what letter is next to their name because they're all the same. Right? And, and in our conversations, in our relationships, sometimes it feels like I don't really need to engage in a conversation with them because I know that's a red person or I know that's a blue person. And if I know they're a red or a blue person, I know everything I need to know about them because they're all the same. And everybody just assumes that everybody's all the same. But we, as as Christians, are called to stand out. We are called to be different. We are called to not blend in with everybody else the same way that everybody else blends in. In fact, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus called us the salt of the earth. He He says this. He says, you are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It's no longer good for anything if it's not salty. It just gets thrown out and trampled underfoot. Have you ever eaten anything that was like way too salty? Yeah, when I was growing up, my mom used to make pies. She used to bake pies all the time, and I love pies. I feel like pie is like out of vogue or something now, but pie is really good, right? And so uh, apple pie is my favorite pie. My mom used to make the best apple pies But there was one time where she baked an apple pie and she didn't realize it. But when she was doing it, she was probably on the phone with this cord that stretched like 50 yards across to the wall. But she she used salt instead of sugar. And she didn't realize it. So we get done with dinner and she goes and she cuts that pie for dessert. She, you know, everybody's got their little plate with the little, you know, we eat our pie. And we all bite into it and you about spit it out, right? It was awful because it was so salty. And the point was that Jesus was making that as as the salt of the earth, we should stand out. 
Because if we just blend in with everybody else, if we do everything that everybody else does, if we fall into the same traps as everybody else, then, then, then what's the point? And then he continued. He said, you're the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, here it is, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds, like your love for other people, and glorify your Father in heaven. He said that Christians should stand out, but not because we fight for our rights the hardest, Not because we demand to be listened to when nobody wants to listen to us, but because we love with a love that the rest of the world thinks that's so different. That's wild. So this political season, can you engage in the political arena? Can you care deeply about it? Can you can you like really care about what happens politically? Yes, of course you can. But here's the takeaway for this morning. You can also disagree politically, but still love unconditionally. We are called to disagree politically, but love unconditionally. This is the the takeaway. This is what I hope you'll remember. Disagree politically, but love unconditionally. Disagree politically, but love unconditionally. And so, because this is the takeaway, would you say this out loud with me? Disagree politically, but love unconditionally. Yeah, one more time. Disagree politically, but love unconditionally. This is what the Good Samaritan did. They disagreed politically. They disagreed as much as two people could ever disagree politically. And yet he chose to love unconditionally. And Jesus said, if you want to be my follower, you do the same thing. Disagree politically, but love unconditionally. And so this week, to put this into practice so that we don't become people who just hear the the message, what God wants to say to us, and then we walk out and we forget it, I want to invite you to put this into practice by finding a way to love in some way somebody that you disagree with politically. I want to invite you to, maybe you send them a note, and you just encourage them, and you bless them with your words. Maybe you buy them a cup of coffee, you know, but you find some way to to love somebody with whom you disagree politically. Some of you are like, well, I don't have relationships with anybody I disagree with politically, and so then maybe you need to start there, right? You need to start building some relationships with somebody. Somebody came up to me after the first service when I said this, and he put his hand on my shoulder, and he said, so, can I buy you a cup of coffee this week? (laughs) Yeah, man, let's do it. Uh, So find some way to love somebody with whom you disagree politically. And don't even tell them what you're doing. Don't say, you know I hate your politics and your political views, but my pastor challenged us to. No, you just just don't even tell them that. I I want you to think of somebody in your world that you disagree with politically, and I want you to remind yourself, it's okay that we disagree politically. I can still love them like Jesus loves them. And you find a way to put into practice your love for your heavenly father. Because loving God and loving people are two sides of the same coin. You do that, and you'll stand out. If we all do that, could you imagine? We would stand out. Could you imagine what what would happen if every Christian in America did that at some point over the next two weeks? The impact that it would make? For 100 million plus Americans to go out of their way to love in some active form, some tangible way, the people with whom they disagree with politically? Could you imagine the impact that could make? So, over the course of the next two weeks, I want to encourage you to be like the Good Samaritan and to see the people's needs and not just what they believe, to love even when you get nothing in return, and to stay salty. If you do that, you can disagree politically and still love unconditionally. And then come back next week for part two of our series, Faith and Politics. I'll see you then.